All right. So welcome to the OFX, OFX podcast. Um, I'm doing the introduction today. Uh, Bethany McChesney here, along with my co-host, Dave Claxon. I did not think of a clever alliteration for his name. Sorry. You kind of let me down. <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot. <laughs> Uh, and today we have um, our guest, Dr. Sasha Gollish. So Sasha is a, and correct me if I'm wrong on any of these, but so you're a professor of engineering at the University of Toronto. Uh, I was a professor of engineering. I now actually work in um, the faculty of kinesiology um, on a really cool project looking at kids in sport. Um, so I'm not a professor kind of any, yeah, we'll leave that yeah. in. So your PhD, though, is from, is in engineering. My PhD is, in fact, in engineering. Yeah, I'm a super nerd. You're not wrong. Yeah, um, that's true. So Sasha is also, she's an elite elite distance runner. Um, she has dabbled in mountain running as well. So you may have recognized her name from the Mountain Running World Championships. Um, just, I'm not going to list your accolades because I will be here for too long with the introduction, but Sasha has um, a world record in the indoor mile for 40 plus women and many Canadian masters records. Um, you are, if you don't mind me saying your age, you're 42, 41, yep. 42, yeah. 42. Yeah. So, um, Sasha and I actually know each other from way back. <laughs> One two years ago, back when we were collegiate runners at the University of Western, um, which is where yeah. you got your undergrad in engineering. And yep. I was a wee pup in my undergrad in um, kinesiology. So we met way back on the cross country team. Um, it was your second degree, though. Your degree it was my second degree. Yeah. 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 So Sasha I have a gap a degree. degree. Some people go on like a gap year vacation. I took a gap degree. Hmm. in like your your first degree economics was it yeah so I was in commerce at U of T um decided I never wanted to be a banker I love math and science so that's why I ended up and western um has many strong faculties but their faculty of engineering and undergraduate education is is very strong and um I not only had a lot of fun there but learned a lot mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Sasha was a mentor for me a little bit when I started running also uh, at university because, again, I was very much a rookie in the world of competitive distance running, and she uh, very much had her feet wet. So I appreciated her mentorship when I started in the distance running world. So way, way back. So and we've kind of maintained contact a little bit, which is kind of cool and, you know, following yeah. each other also in our journey. So the interesting thing about Sasha is she stepped away from the running world for a good chunk of time, came back in your 30s and started tearing things up again, which is always interesting too, because again, like in our world of hybrid racing and OCR, yeah. a lot of a lot of athletes are coming into it after another sport career that kind of took a dive or, you know, they needed to shift because of different reasons. So we do have a lot of people that are kind of coming into it in a competitive side, even in their 30s or even in their 40s or beyond. So we do have um, that type of population as well in the hybrid racing scene. So maybe just share a little bit then what brought you back to running? Uh, I mean, I was working too much. So I had this awesome engineering consulting job. I was working in roadside construction with this incredible team, but like we worked long hours, right? Like construction is just long hours. You go back to the office and, you know, friends had said to me, like, can we miss you? Like, can you please come back to running? And I, so, you know, I, I actually would run while at the office. So if I got a complicated math or engineering problem, I'd be like, Hey, I'm just going to put my stuff on. I need to step away from this problem and kind of like go run on the trails, connect with nature and solve it. So I was always active. I just wasn't competing, but my friends were like, listen, you are, you know, you're a hermit on the weekends. Could you think about coming back to practice? And so I negotiated with the people I was working with that I could leave early Monday and Thursday, which is like, if you run in Toronto, you're like, Oh, those are the days everybody works out um so that I could meet up with the team again and so it was really for social reasons at first um yes through activity um but that was like my sneaky way back in I guess was really finding my sense of belonging again with with my girlfriends and then meeting other elite runners and and wondering sort of as I was dipping my toe in as I got faster like do I get to play the what if game like am I actually going to be this like anomaly that gets to play what if and I did mm-hmm yeah so, and 
sorry, define, go ahead. define the what if game here, just so that we're a little, we're a little clear. Sure. So, um, okay. So I stole this from Brad Stolberg. Um, so Brad Stolberg has written a bunch of books, but in one of his episodes with Steve Magnus, he was talking about like, yeah, I wonder if, what if, what had happened if I didn't burn out when I was, you know, going from high school to college with, and I can't remember the coaching situation. Like it was a toxic coaching situation that he quit, but he quit. And like Brad's a really good athlete. It's like, well, I wonder what could have happened. And in a sense, I got to play that game, right? Like I really stepped away from high performance athletics, right? It, um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, but then I got to kind of dip my toe back in and, and, and play the what if game. Like, I wonder what might happen. And the, you know, the courage to do that, to be like, I'm on this path that is this traditional path that we're supposed to take supposed to quotation marks right go to school get a degree or two <laughs> um right find a partner have kids don't have kids get a career move through your career move up the corporate ladder and i mean for sure i've never fit like in a box um i've never really followed a traditional path and when you know i sort of got the confidence and really for my mom to say go play the what if game quit your job go try running because you'll never get this opportunity again in life um I, I really seized the okay let's go play this what if game and I like maybe that should be the title of my of a book I write one day like mm -hmm. go play the what if game like whatever the what if game is to you right the worst that happens is you have a lot of fun along the way you meet some really interesting people and you connect you may not reach the pinnacle of where you wanted to get to but I promise along the way that there's this adventure and so you know how do we play more of that what if game and getting off that like the railroad of the stereotype life i like it. so and then you so went back a, and you actually ran perfect. you ran varsity again right i, I actually you. ran varsity three times <laughs> at U of T. <laughs> so i technically went back when i was doing my master's when i was working at the ministry of transportation of ontario um, I was taking three courses. So technically I was eligible working full time. So my running was not fabulous, like something had to give. Um, and then I did go back again in 2015 to pursue my PhD alongside running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so in 2023, you also were named to our Canadian team. You ran at uh, the Marathon World Championships. Um, so Sasha, one of the craziest things about Sasha is her range. So from the 1500 meter on the track, to the marathon so she can kind of do it all which is also really impressive so um you name it and she nice. probably has a championship in it so it's very impressive so I think, was it 2022 that we called the year of sasha gaulish that was the year 2022 is the year of sasha gaulish i actually ran all of the canadian championships okay so beth here's another like tidbit i actually really love the 600 indoors so like yes i love the 1500 but did you ever run a 600 indoors um no <laughs> I once had okay. to do at the end of a four by four because someone was yeah. injured and that's what you do with the distance runners and it was mm -hmm. so painful <laughs> oh yeah it is so and I would come at it very much from a distance side so it would almost be like I wasn't in the race going through the first 200 um but there was something one there's something super satisfying about running on the indoor track just it, it's short laps go by really quickly it feels really fast and so the 600 feels really fast and so i i'm one of the few people that would negative split and there was just something so satisfying about passing like everybody that you could in that last 200 meters and i think regardless of what race avenue right like like ocr marathon short distance like there's something pretty empowering when you have that sort of like second wind like guttural strength to like come through and do something right and like the confidence it gives you to like try other things while you're racing and even like trust yourself to try doing something outside of the sport that you're doing it's like being on the hunt it's like yeah but like but trusting that you're on a hunt where you're not going to fall prey right and that's such a different feeling right like that ability to trust yourself and for sure like you have to fail to get there right like it's not this like linear path of like oh it feels so good all the time and it works <laughs> out all the time right like this isn't a fairy tale that this is reality right and but understand you have to understand your failure boundaries so that you can actually approach them so that you can actually then build this like trusting confidence that you have in yourself to like go out and be able to do things and not fall prey 
to the things around you, especially the things that are out of your control, right? Like, I think weather and climate change are things that we're all going to come up against when we're racing in the future. And like, that's something we can't control. And so like, those are the things like, don't fall prey to that. Right. Like for me, I get really cold. It would be like, put the right clothes on so that if it's raining and cold, you don't freeze so that you can't race. Yeah. It's like the show up and blow up. Sometimes you have to really push that line and see like, yeah. where can I actually go until I actually blow up? And that's kind of what yeah. you do in that second half. Hmm. Oh, in the 600, you blow up no matter what. I don't care who you are. You blow up in the 600. It just depends on wh- how close to the finish line it happens. Yeah. Yeah. Just get as close as possible. Uh, yeah. As possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a little bit about Sasha's accomplishments. But the reason that we have Sasha on and the reason I even mentioned her age, because I would never normally do that, is um, <laughs> Sasha is a um, a very big um, advocate right now for just reducing the stigmas around perimenopause. And if you don't follow Sasha yet on social media, I find your your um, reels incredibly entertaining and hilarious. Thank you. And just kind of speaking about the things again that women don't talk about. And as athletes too, because we are, we're so fine tuned and we're so into all um, like everything that happens within our body and it affects us sometimes on a deeper level because we expect so much out of our bodies when these changes start to happen um, it can be met with a lot of frustration and also as I'm realizing more and more misinformation or complete lack of information and yeah. so that's really the biggest reason I wanted to bring you on because you again um, you know your stuff you're in it right now and you and a couple other people if you follow Camille Heron she talks a lot about it yeah. as and um just and again a high performance athlete um still out there rocking it but she's dealing again with perimenopause and the things and it's again it's not the end of your athletic life it's just we learn and we shift and the more that we can talk about this and learn from each other and our own experiences um the more we can help and help women to continue to compete through this and beyond and um also i i'm going to preface this with also saying sasha is not a doctor of medicine so we're speaking <laughs> from her experience and what she has learned which i mean in this day and age anyways people listen uh, very flippantly to a lot of people's misinformation all the time on social media. So understand we are um, very educated in this to the degree that we are from personal experience and our own um, knowledge just from research and everything that you have done. So um, that's kind of where we're coming at it. Um, not medical doctors, but you know we're going to share Sasha's experience and what she's learned. So Sasha. We did have a lot, um, a lot of questions, but um, we're we'll just talk first about um, what would be then the difference. So some people might have not even really ever heard what perimenopause is, just menopause. So what then would be the difference, the defining difference between perimenopause and menopause? Um, okay, so a couple just to go back. So it's destigmatizing not just perimenopause, but like all the things that come with like. Mm-hmm generalizing here being a woman right like those of us with a menstrual cycle and so um I didn't know that perimenopause was a whole phase of the menstrual cycle life cycle right and so perimenopause kind of happens in this phase before menopause and so roughly speaking it's about 10 years before you hit menopause so what's very interesting is we talk about menopause as a phase menopause is a moment in time menopause is the moment that you lose your period and you then enter post-menopause Right. So we talk about menopause like it's this phase, but it's a moment in time. And so perimenopause is the other side of that moment in time that's menopause before postmenopause. And it's um, a little bit where things go off the rails in a sense. Right. So if we think about, you know, either biology class or health and physical education, depending on where you grew up and when where you went to school. Right. We, we talked about puberty and generalized. You know, we say that when girls go through puberty, they get their menstrual cycle and it's a period. And approximately every 28 days, which is really actually every 21 to 42, and 28 is not to the average of those two numbers, just so we're clear. Um, mm-hmm. Every 28 days, you're going to have a bleed. There's sort of like four phases, like the post phase, the peak of your hormones, then leading back into your bleed and your bleed. And then you repeat that till you get pregnant and then it returns to normal after you get pregnant. And then one day you stop getting your period. It is not that simple at all. Bethany, you have three children? 
Two. Okay. You have, anyways, you have multiple children, right? (laughs) Your period did not return to like, oh, it's what it's like out of a textbook. And so Mm -hmm. in this conversation, what we don't talk about at all is this phase that as you get older and you approach menopause, things change. You're, and it's, it's really that your hormones are changing that are, that's causing all of these other changes. And it's related to, you know, the number of eggs that you are producing and that are falling, which is what affects our, the hormones and the hormone curve through your cycle. Mm -hmm. So the, and there's some misconceptions too around menopause as it's defined and people often just think menopause is when you start getting hot flashes. And the right. interesting <laughs> thing too about the whole pre and uh, perimenopause phases is a, like a lot of women, their symptoms are so different. And when you're defining what it means to be in perimenopause, there's, we have like 50 to 70 different symptoms that could all fall into that. Um, because our hormones, the whole, the endocrine system is in charge of so much, you know, from, uh, like weight, your gut, your mood, your, um, like insulin, like all these, the way you digest food, like all there's, it's in charge of so many things, your body temperature control. So there's so many different symptoms. Some women might not ever even have hot flashes. So we, yep. we kind of put these labels on it that it can really be completely false. So um, a lot of times women have started perimenopause and they don't even necessarily know it because you know, they're just, they're more tired than they used to be. They're not recovering the same. And they would never necessarily connect that with being in a perimenopausal state or they have a major life change. And so maybe their mood is different, but you can kind of chalk it up to, you know, the the job change, the mood, the, you know, the house move, the marital breakdown, whatever. But, you know, some of it is related to the hormone shifts that are happening during perimenopause as well. So there's so many misconceptions around that. One of, and one of the things too, actually, that I would be remiss to not say is particularly with perimenopause and athletes, right? And, you know, I, I just want to say like, yes, I perform at like one of the highest levels, but so many people perform at a really high level as well. And so one of the other challenges with perimenopause is many of the symptoms look like REDS. So if you look at the new update to the REDS CAT2 tool, and you look at the health effects of what REDS, so relative energy deficiency syndrome, because in sport, sorry, relative energy deficiency syndrome in sport because acronyms are fun, but you need to tell people what they mean. So many of the symptoms sort of mirror what, what red S, right? This like low energy availability might look like. And one of the challenges when you're going through perimenopause is, and you know, I think this is one of the questions you want to ask me is around weight gain. And so if you're going into low energy availability, because you're trying to manipulate your weight in a certain way, you may actually have both perimenopause and reds. Um, And so trying to untangle the two can be really challenging. And so it's really important as an athlete to have, you know, a team that you work with, and that could be doctor, naturopath, chiropractor, like there's all these amazing people working out there that really understand sport and nutrition from a holistic perspective so that, you know, you could be both in reds and perimenopause, but you may also just be in reds or you may be in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. So then for yourself, what were your first symptoms that led you down the road of trying to figure out what it was and eventually figuring out you were in perimenopause? So I didn't, when I went into perimenopause, I had no idea that um, perimenopause was a thing, right? So I, right, so I'm a little bit older than you, um, but I really grew up in a time where you didn't talk about periods and you didn't talk about what was going on. And I was the ultimate tomboy, which is a word I'm not, sure you're supposed to use anymore but I was a tomboy in that time so I'm using that word so all of that period product was hidden and I never talked about it and I just like it was part of my life that happened but I didn't talk about it and I didn't talk about it with anybody and so I think I went into perimenopause somewhere around the time that I was about 36 years old Um, my periods really started to change I got really heavy bleeding and I got really bad cramping and for my entire life I had really low bleeding and no cramping. So like that should have been an alarm bell, but I was just like, well, I guess this is just different and that's what this is. But what that actually is signaling is your body can no longer produce the amount of estrogen that it needs. And so to do that, it's releasing more eggs, which causes a heavier bleed, thicker lining, et cetera. Um, And so, so though that was looking back, one of the main symptoms, what sort of like pushed me over the edge and the precipice was, um, 
I was achy all the time. Like my knees and my feet, it was, it's probably similar to what arthritis pain is like, like um, when you have it in a really like dull, consistent way. So like two out of 10 pain, but all the time. And Advil, like ibuprofen wouldn't control it. Tylenol wouldn't kind of like take care of the pain. Like I, it was just very uncomfortable. And my muscles didn't feel like they were working for me. So my muscles kind of felt like this like sack of mashed potatoes in a burlap sack. And so you're like, I know that when I'm running, they're supposed to contract. So my feet and my knees hurt and my muscles don't are not working for me. Um, and then on dry skin, oh my gosh, my skin would just like flake off my arms. And I was like, I'm literally rubbing coconut oil into my skin. Like, this should be absorbing, you know, and I have a dog who was like, oh, you're rubbing coconut oil. I'm just going <laughs> to lick you. And I'm like, no, no, no. If you lick it off, this isn't going to do what I needed to do. So like, I'm just anyways. So those were some of my major symptoms. I got, wait, no, that's not true. Brain fog was a good one where I was like, I don't remember what I was supposed to be doing. And I also have this crazy imposter syndrome as I'm sitting at my computer. I'm going to sit here with my hands on my keyboard and do nothing because I'm so debilitated by my imposter syndrome that I can't even write an email. Yeah, so like all of those things too, some people just kind of chalk that up to normal or, and I find the brain fog thing is so common and also, and people just say, oh, I'm getting older, I'm getting, or um, yeah, there's, and then the first thing that you do when you go to the doctor and you're saying my periods are heavy, typically then, from my client's experience, also, you get put on birth control pills to control yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I I use a hormonal IUD, right? So I'm on, not no, I'm on the Kylena, not the other one. So the one that's like a slightly lower dose of progesterone. And so, again, not a doctor, not an expert, but there is evidence that when you um, can get your progesterone regulated. If your body is able to, it will then continue to produce estrogen. And so it regulates the flow. Um, right. So most people go on an IUD because they're like, oh, this is fantastic birth control and I'm never going to get a bleed. And I'm like, yeah, that actually is winning. There's no question about it. Like they're like having your period just like kind of sucks, especially as an athlete. You're like, this just sucks. So anyways, Having an IUD can be really helpful. I need to say that a copper IUD is the opposite of that. And so if you go into the off, into your doctor's office and they offer you a copper IUD, just be well aware that yes, the hormones may do the same things, but the bleed will not at all be the same, which I think is a misconception. Um, Gwen Jorgensen has a couple podcasts where she is fabulously hilarious about it. I'll leave it to her to explain. Um, but you need to be on a hormonal IUD if you're in perimenopause and you're looking for some of those hormonal replacement therapy techniques. Yeah, so that was actually, so maybe, okay, before I get into hormone replacement therapy techniques, when, so how then did you end up getting diagnosed or figuring out that you were in perimenopause? Um, I think I kind of posted some stuff. So I think two things. I posted some stuff on Instagram. I was like, why, why do I feel this way? Um, and someone who's a family physician um, that I know in the US who I used to run with was like, I think you're in perimenopause, which immediately was like, hello, Google machine. What is perimenopause? And I was like, oh, hello. Yes, I am. Um I mean, I just didn't know that it, it really existed. So that was probably somewhere around when I was 40. Um, so like I, for four years, I would say, I wouldn't say I was suffering, but there were definitely like symptoms that I was unaware of. And I wish I had known earlier what this was. I wonder if it had, would have changed some of the tra trajectory of my career. I don't think so. I think I've accomplished amazing things. Uh, I still have a few what ifs. I think we'll always all have some what ifs. Um, but just in terms of like overall life, contentedness I think knowing earlier it would have been really helpful so like we talked about this isn't on the recording so I'll mention now like I'm injured right and I haven't run for four months and I miss it and even though I was running then there was this like loss of competency of feeling like a master in my own body at the time that I craved right like regardless of what 
level of runner you're at, you reach your own level of mastery. And when you lose that, it's really hard. And so I was able to get that back, but I like really fell off this precipice of not being able to do the thing that I loved the most. Mm -hmm. Um, Did you ever get your hormones tested? I did. So I was initially working with Inside Tracker when Inside Tracker would send me um, free um, blood tests, and they are fabulous and an incredible complement of of tests. So getting your hormones tested, I think, is really important. As you are sort of like figuring out where you're at, probably every quarter, right? To see, um, I mean, you might see that your levels are low, um, but to see if they're declining, um, specifically estrogen and progesterone, let me be clear in terms of like hormones, um, DHEA, which I can't remember what the acronym is for. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's one other one, um, you, and you also want to be watching your, this, this, the, 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 not going to, it'll come to me. Anyways. Um, PSH? Probably. Thyroid stimulating hormone? That would be exactly what it is. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, but I then went to see my family doctor who, he was pretty funny. So he's like, listen, I don't think you're in perimenopause, but I want to hear all of your symptoms. And he let me go through everything. Like, I think I spoke to him for 30 minutes. Most people, when they go to their doctor's office, get seven seconds before their doctor cuts them off. My doctor didn't cut me off, but he would ask me questions. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. And so we've done my blood work sort of in six month increments now. And he's been fantastic. I know that it is not the case. And actually, at the end of the 30 minutes, he was like, I'm pretty sure you're in perimenopause. Let's get your blood work done. It's been about four months. I'd love to see where you're at again. And he's been fantastic. And so, um, I think as women, right, like we're still under this like marginalization of like being really careful about what we ask for and what we advocate for. And it's really important to advocate for your health. And so going into your doctor's office and framing it as these are my symptoms. I'm not playing Dr. Google. I do know that these are symptoms of perimenopause. I would like to have my hormones tested. And if you get pushback, I think you need to say to your doctor, you know, like, please tell me why you won't do this. And if they say, because you're too young to be in perimenopause or X, Y, Z, that doesn't make sense. You're allowed to push back. Yes, they are an expert. But one of the challenges that we know, and this is like, not necessarily a criticism of the medical system, but like, just an awareness, like both my parents are doctors, I think the medical system does amazing things. But like, female reproductive, like other than delivering babies really isn't part of training, particularly for family doctors. And family doctors are expected to know an inordinate amount of information. And so you're, you know, advocating for yourself, there are more and more family doctors and more and more OBGYNs who are talking about these things um, so that you should get your hormone levels tested. And like, even post pregnancy, right? Like, there's a lot of challenges that happen with pregnancy and post pregnancy, like getting your values tested, probably Okay, I haven't had a baby, so I can't answer this question, but probably in the three to six month range after, if you're really looking to be active, you probably want to know where your hormones are at so that you don't hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. So, and when you're getting your hormones tested and correct me if I'm wrong, because this is what I have heard, you want to do it on day five of your cycle. Yes, when you're, uh, do it when you're in the luteal phase. So, so here's what the, this will vary, right? So I think you basically want to do it three to four days after your bleed, right? Mm-hmm. So you want, so if you bleed longer, which is normal, or you bleed shorter, which is normal, right? You want to make sure that you're out of that bleed phase. Um, Inside Tracker and Whoop have done an incredible job at providing that information um, online uh, for people. Mm-hmm. So Fitter is the app that I use to track my period. So make sure you're tracking your period so you can actually get your blood tested at the right time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what about for people that don't have a period? It depends on why, right? And so yeah. um, if you're on uh, birth 
control, you actually will know exactly what that day is, right? Because you have a steady state of, of hormone release. If you have an IUD, what you need to do is start tracking your symptoms. Um, Dr. Stacy Sims does a lot of good work around this. Um, and another one does as well. But basically, download a period app, right? So Fitter or can't remember Stacy Sims, Roar, and start tracking your symptoms. And all of a sudden, you'll actually be able to see where you are in your cycle. But because you have an IUD, um, you are going to have a little bit more normality um, to your cycle. But there are IUD or not, there's some pretty definitive cycles as to where the egg release happens um, yep. at the top of the cycle. So you can figure it out on either side. Yeah. Even taking um, like your morning body temperature, you can see mm -hmm. um, a little spike. Um, so this is if if you're checking, getting your blood work and your hormones tested, um, again, your estrogen and progesterone are the ones that you're looking at. So it's really important also to understand then what estrogen does. So I did write out a list of um, what estrogen is primarily, uh, what its jobs are. And again, it does many, many things in our system. But if these things are, you're starting to notice a change in them, get your hormones checked to see if maybe your estrogen levels are dropping. So when estrogen levels start to drop in your system, um, you you do notice a decrease in muscle tissue. So you, you can't, you don't maintain it as well. Mitochondrial function. So your endurance might be affected. Um, it, um, it affects inflammation, your blood sugars, it regulates your appetite, mood regulation. So maybe you're not able to um, self-regulate as well. Um, emotionally, it controls cortisol, which is your stress hormone. So you might be finding you're waking up in the middle of the night, racing thoughts, you're too anxious for things that you would normally not be. It controls body temperature. So you you get really cold or you get really hot and there, you have a hard time transitioning out of that. It controls your blood pressure. Uh, it maintains and builds bone and it maintains your vaginal lining. So all things... Yep. So again, that's a huge range of things. And as it starts to drop, it affects different people differently within that range of um, um, things that it does. And then progesterone helps to counterbalance. So hang on, just stop there for a sec. Mm -hmm. I just want to stop you there for a sec. So guys, here I'm talking to you. So estrogen is the female sex hormone. Testosterone is the male sex hormone. So if you're a guy listening to this, like what would it be like for me? It would be like your testosterone not only is it tank, but just picture it like dipping and like waving all around and imagine being like, oh, all those things, like your appetite, your stress level, your sleep, um, just like generally how you feel, your muscle tone, like all of that in flux, right? It would be based on changing testosterone. So now we'll go back to progesterone. So I just want to, I just wanted the guys to feel welcome today. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it is good too. And Dave can chime in later, but ways to support someone in going through perimenopause. Um, so yeah, then progesterone helps to balance out a lot of these, uh, the negative sides of the lowering of estrogen. So you want these things to be in balance. Um, so progesterone, particularly as it lowers, that would be the one where if you're finding that you're particular like the cortisol in your racing mind at night, it helps with the calming effects of things. So progesterone, um, if you're finding you don't calm down well at night. So that's kind of just a completely broad stroke of what lowering estrogen uh, does affect. So um so within that then, so let's get to some questions that people have given and if we haven't talked on them yet. Um, okay. So when, do you go through phases where you struggle and then you're feeling good and you kind of go back and forth? I for sure did. Um, now that I'm on some consistent hormone therapy, I don't. Um, I think the other thing, I just want to go back for a second to say, um, uh, testosterone. So women also have testosterone, right? Like our dominant sex steroid is estrogen, but we also have testosterone. And so it's really important that you get your testosterone checked. Um, some women going through perimenopause, it just kind of stays the same. Some get a little bit of an elevation and some, for some women, it tanks. And when it tanks, um, all like, just imagine like it would be even worse. So like mine's pretty steady, which has been great, but I've heard for women who've had like testosterone that's tanked, it is just like 
a whirlwind of awfulness. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and when we, we forgot to go back to hormone replacement therapy, but hormone replacement therapy, again, it, you could be, um, you could be replacing, uh, testosterone as well for women, testosterone, progesterone, yeah. or estrogen. And, um, it's kind of a symptom based thing. And from everything that I've heard, it's a little bit of a guessing game. You can test your hormones, but based on as far as what your symptoms are, it's a bit of a guessing game. So, and then with hormone replacement therapy, there's different ways to get it. Sometimes it's oral, sometimes it's injections, sometimes it's creams, sometimes it's patches. Yeah. Um, and then I also would add in terms of hormone replacement therapy. So Dr. Mary Claire on Instagram is a physician in the U S she is trained in this. She has awesome information. Highly recommend everybody follow her. I have no affiliation with this woman. She's also pretty funny, which is great. Um, and also Dr. Stacey Sims. So like ashwagandha is another, um, it's not a hormone replacement therapy, um, it's an but it's got, yeah, it's an adaptogen and it's got known, effects of like helping with cortisol. Right. And so along with like, you know, quotation marks, typical hormone replacement therapy, they recommend that women in perimenopause take ashwagandha in the morning, which I also do. And so to me, it's like part of the hormone replacement therapy, because in a sense, it's managing my cortisol. So one of the other things, so I am like, I love getting up early in the morning and doing work. Like it, it just like get a workout done, crush work feels so good. But my cortisol spike from that can be unbelievable. So that by noon, I'm like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so anxious. And so I found that taking ashwagandha in terms of like managing my hormones, just sort of like mitigates that cortisol spike so that I still get the same amount of work done, but that I don't end up in that anxiety spiral later in the day. Mm -hmm. So ashwagandha, it's, um, it's like, it's a plant. So there's, there wouldn't be negative side effects to it. So if it's something anybody could really, um, take it anyway. So it does negate the effects of high cortisol. So it helps your body's, um, stress systems to calm down. So, and it also even digestion, which can be affected by stress. Um, and again, your temperature and your immune system. So it's a good one. If you ever wanted to look into something to add to your supplement repertoire, there's no real negative side effects. The thing with adaptogens though, is, um, so they do, again, they, they build in your system. So it takes a bit and then you would want to cycle off of them every yes. six eight weeks for three to four days. So you don't build, um, a tolerance to them. So, and it just has to yep. be three to four days and, um, and then you could go back on it. So the, the ashwagandha is probably the main one. And then in Stacey Sims book, so her new one, she listed some other ones, holy basil, radiola, which is good for cognition. So I, I do take that one as well. Um, Shazandra for mental, um, for concentration as well. And then maca. So, which, which is also specifically supports the sex hormones. So we've probably yeah. heard about that too. It's in drinks a lot of times too now. So yeah. Um, yeah. So I those are, that's adapted. Yeah. So that's another thing that you could take outside of getting into hormone replacement therapy. I have a quick question about the hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. If this is a uneducated question, it is. No, no, no question is uneducated because everybody's uneducated because there's no education on this. So you're good. <laughs> you haven't hung around me long enough. Believe me, I've got stupid questions. So, <laughs> When it comes to uh, like a hormone replacement therapy and you say testosterone up and down, spiking, going over the place, popularly tanking as yeah. a high level elite athlete, where obviously that can be uh, um, a problem in testing for, 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 you know, performance enhancing drugs. Does that become a slippery slope and hard to navigate? Yes and no. So, um, so it shouldn't, right? Like this is a n normal part of, 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 female development. And so I think one of the things we have to remember is the sports system was primarily set up for, for males, right? Um, I don't need to go into the history of that. It is set up for males. Um, last year in 2023, um, I believe this individual is named Cal Calamia. I cannot remember what their pronouns are. So to be politically correct, I'm going to say they for now. Cal Calamia is a transgender man and was given a TUE to take testosterone 
for hormone support to become a man. And so I think we've opened the door to say that the way that things work for females is a little bit different. And so Cal Calamia is subjected to much more anti-doping testing, I believe, to stay, and Cal, Cal, I believe they have to stay within the range that is considered, quotation marks, normal for a female, which is less than 2.5 nanomoles per, per milliliter, liter? Okay, I can't remember the exact, doesn't matter. Um, it would require a little bit more work, but I think that those are conversations that need to happen because these are normal things that happen. Um, I think if someone is going to use testosterone in a negative, deleterious performance advantage way, I think they're going to do it anyways. And so um, I don't think we need to be writing policy for the people who just want to perform and live who they are. Um, and I'm not even sure that the policy is going to stop people from doing it. So that's a whole other topic we could talk about another day. But it's, it's a really important thing to talk about. Um, and I think that you know, WADA really is like linked to the IOC and then it, it is up to the various um, countries and organizations. But I think we're going to see a shift in, and I hope we see a shift in this because otherwise we're narrowly defining what it is to be a woman to compete in this like very narrow box when it's a little bit wider than that. And, um, you know, with women's hormones doing this, you know, we need to be a little bit more sensitive to how we deal with things. And it's okay to say that there are differences between males and females. And so, you know, how one might get a TUE might be a little bit different for a female. Not a dumb question. Well, I'll come up with one. Give me time. <laughs> <laughs> I can come up with one too. We're in good company. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's interesting because our sport is just kind of starting to write some of the rules around PEDs. So it's been a little bit more of a discussion recently. So it's interesting also to see the way that it all kind of plays out with when, you know, people are taking things for just health reasons also that are on. Yeah. This. And I mean, again, that's a whole podcast in itself when we're talking about PEDs. So, um, Go, going back to some of so the questions, so I, when it comes to people that my clients and what they struggle with, the biggest question that and their frustration is the gain weight during this time, and yeah. what do they, what can we do to counteract the effects of that? Why does that happen, and what should their training look like? And that this is like a five part question. <laughs> so but yeah, the <laughs> training and then nutrition that all kind of goes together. So the weight gain part during perimenopause, um, and then what did they do about it from your perspective? So the menopause is right. The, the, the tire that you develop around your waist is actually your body just trying to produce estrogen, right? So estrogen is a sex based hormone, but it's a fat based hormone. And so to produce estro estrogen, it needs fat. And so basically what it's doing to produce estrogen is it's layering on fat so that it can produce more estrogen so that your body can function. And so if you start to sort of notice that one thing to sort of be aware is diet isn't going to help you. There is nothing in your nutrition that you can do to stop that from happening. Um, and actually the, the research on low energy availability, particularly in females, um, as you start to like have a negative energy balance, right? And a, and a prolonged negative energy balance, you're really going to start to gain weight around your middle because you it's trying to produce even more estrogen to keep up with, with state of life things. So if when you start to notice that, one, just remember there's probably not much that you can do with your diet. Really good time to go see your doctor to get your hormones tested to see if you need either an estrogen building block or to take estrogen itself. Um, around diet, um, I'm not an expert I would say that I think most of the world probably doesn't eat, well, most of the female world, I should say, doesn't eat enough protein. And so during this time, as you're going through this like repair, right? So how you have to really be conscious of like how much fuel you need going into your workout, but you actually need to be way more conscious about the protein and the fat, right? Because we need fat for some pretty critical repair things along with the protein to recover from the workouts that we're doing. And so we know that typically women don't eat enough protein during their days. And so 
how can you add protein supplementation? Like for me, it's literally adding protein supplements because I just get tired of eating food. Um, and there are some pretty delicious protein supplements out there. So why not? Um, so really thinking about protein supplementation and, and eating those good fats. So like the olive oils, the avocados, the nuts, the seeds, right? Like the, the, you know, whole, whole, whole food fats, and then really being thoughtful about what kind of carbohydrates and fuel you're putting in your body. So like I could pretty much eat anything, candy, cake, et cetera. And like those days are gone, right? Like my metabolism has changed a bit. That doesn't mean that I don't eat sweets and treats at times, but I'm just a little bit more thoughtful. And I was pretty thoughtful about my diet overall, but I'm even more thoughtful about what types of carbohydrates I'm putting in my body, knowing how like highly processed carbohydrates aren't really used in your body all that well and can just be stored as fat if it's like, I don't need this as fuel right now. Mm -hmm. So speaking on the nutrition part, I'm just going to reiterate what Mary Claire, who you mentioned her previously as well, a doctor, what she recommends. So the two biggest things that you want to start with is one, make sure you get enough protein. So with, with my clients, I usually say um, a gram of protein per pound that you would weigh. Yep. So it's a pretty, it's a, it's a rough calculation, but essentially, so if you are a 130 pound female, I'll try to get 130 grams of protein. Um, yep. And then the second thing is fiber. So a lot of people super under consume fiber and what, and so again, that number that you're aiming for is about 30 grams a day. Most women get about 10. And the reason for fiber is that so it helps to stabilize your insulin. And again, with lowering estrogen levels, um, it which affects, again, your insulin sensitivity. So then fiber will help to counteract that. It also helps your gut microbiome. And as we're starting to learn more about the gut microbiome and its effect on the brain and mood, because our neurotransmitters are actually being produced in your gut. Um, so the, the healthier you can help the gut microbiome, um, the healthier you, you are overall. And so fiber was her number two. So protein and fiber. Um, and then outside of that, just the supplements that she recommended were so vitamin D, which is also a precursor for some of our hormones, vitamin D with K2, and then creatine. So I don't know if you take creatine, but it is also something I recommend to my clients, but creatine. Um, and again, there's a lot of misconceptions around it um, based on when it yeah. first came out in the nineties and yeah. people were hyperdosing with it and getting puffy, but creatine actually really helps with brain inflammation and also helps with maintaining your muscle tissue and bone tissue. And again, because that's something that women start to notice that they lose at an increasing rate um, during menopause. So it helps with that and just five grams a day. So it's just yeah. one scoop in your shake. And, um, yeah. And so that would be the other supplement that was recommended. So just a quick, what, what was recommended by the expert. Um, that's what she said about that. Yes. I take all of those things. Why don't take fiber? I eat fiber. Yeah. So, and it, a lot of people don't get enough fiber. So what I do, if you're like, okay, I don't really know. One, one trick that I recommend to my clients first is so two tablespoons of chia seeds in a little bit of almond milk, soak it overnight and you have 10 grams of fiber to start your day. So then you're right. already off on a good track. And then if you're eating leafy greens in the day, you're probably going to get pretty close. Yeah. So. It's not super complicated. You can get fiber supplements even that you put in your coffee. But anyways, so then that's the nutrition piece. <laughs> so then what about training? Because this is another thing is, um, again, and I such a misconception also. People think um, if I want to lose weight, I'm just going to start hammering away at cardio. And from, again, your experience and knowledge, what do women need to do as they're in the perimenopausal state and their hormones are starting to shift in regards to training? I mean, Stacey Sims says the best, lift heavy shit, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that, like, like you got to get your muscles to go to fatigue, right? And so, like, there is also a misconception that if you lift heavy things that you're going to, like, super bulk, Right you're not if you're taking performance enhancing drugs you might but that's we're taking there's a whole let's just leave that but this idea of muscle building right and getting your muscle to to fatigue right and and shifting and i think like let's go let's 
let's go to the queen of all of this. Let's talk about Camille Heron, who just set the six day record, right? Like Camille Heron doesn't run for eight hours a day to train for that event, right? She'll run, she usually does, I think, sort of roughly two one to one and a half hour runs a day, which if you're going into a six day record is really not a ton of running, but she lifts, right? Like you, you have to have muscle mass to actually get any gains from that endurance. I don't know your clients all that well, but one of the things like that I've seen in my coaching practice around, like when you shift to a different modality. So as a runner, right? Like when you, when people shift to the bike or the elliptical, they can't get their heart rate up. Right. And so, you know, it's, I'm doing cardio, but I'm on the elliptical and my heart rate's at 110. Like it's not doing anything for you. Right. Like that's nice that you're probably on your phone too. So like you haven't even taken a brain break. Right. So, um, I think the whole thing is like thinking about how you get your muscles to go into fatigue. Right. And so you have to lift. And so you don't have to lift until like collapse, but you have to lift kind of like when you're training for any endurance events where your legs muscles get tired, like your muscles have to fatigue and get some, some tiredness in them. And to do that, you've got to lift something that's reasonably heavy. Heavy to me, to you, to di diff different, right? And as we progress through life, like that is going to change as well, right? And, and being open and sensitive to that. But also like, if you work a lot and you go to, and you travel a lot for work and you end up in hotel gyms, and like 15 to 20 pounds are all you can work with, make it work, right? Like don't skip the workout and be like, well, there's nothing like heavy here to lift. Do enough sets that are enough reps that you get to that fatigue, but then like make it a priority that other times when you go to the gym that you are lifting heavy things with fewer repetitions to get to that fatigue. And I promise you, it will actually just make you faster. I like lifted throughout my entire running career and I absolutely swear by it. And like you go watch Femme Kabul, um Emma Emma Bates um the steeplechaser like there's all these world class women on the the running circuit in the middle distance and they lift a ton just mm -hmm. it's amazing I, yeah. I'm like kind of miss it because I with my knee injury I can't really lift the same way right now so it's kind of sucks mm -hmm. um but yeah it's super important to maintain muscle mass and can and almost try to continue to like slightly micro tear to be building muscle mass, not in a like bulking way, but you're going to be losing some. So if you can build some, you stay like it's net zero effect. So one, one quick question about that, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and one, I'm almost uh, asking for a clarification. And so yeah. for some people, we, we've talked about this before. Uh, those who are worried you're going to get too bulky from lifting heavy, you don't accidentally become jacked. It, it's it's no. not gonna happen. Don't worry about it. It's not it's not a stressor. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but when you're saying to lift heavy shit, obviously you're not telling people you should go out and every day work out and shoot for a one rep max. No, not at all. So maybe just a little clarification on like what lift heavy shit would be like, you know? Because I'm I'm sure. I'm all in favor. I I I'm, I really like the idea of of everyone lifting and, and so we're still talking your about your rep range of like your six to eight. Yeah, yeah and like even four to six, right? Mm -hmm. Like even sometimes going down to that four to six, right? Not every time, but but putting on that extra weight and not like also don't start at your four rep weight. Um, lots of injuries can happen that way too, right? Like if you get injured and you have to take a break from lifting, start light again and work back up to getting heavy, right? Like I think there's also that misconception that I have to go straight to heavy, which just leads to further injuries, which puts you out even longer. So let's go back to lightweights to get back to heavyweights. And so it is anywhere between sort of what I've been told four and eight with my, like with legs, I often aim for four to six. And then with, with upper body, I'm often aiming for six to eight. And I, that might just be like the coach is trying to balance out like what I was trying to do as a runner, right. Where you may want a little bit of a like strong, but lighter upper body and really strong engine to propel you down the road and one thing for me that i've always talked to people to and, and said uh because i find a lot of people have struggled with mitigating effort and and not to generalize but i've uh, trained with a lot of women who who struggle to lift heavy enough where they're actually getting it and to me and the advice i tell them is those last couple of reps whether you're doing 
four, 12, 10, whatever you're doing for the amount of reps. Those last couple shouldn't be very easy. Those ones, they should be a bit of a struggle. You should mm -hmm. be putting the effort into it. And that to me is a guideline for, that's how I know I'm lifting heavy shit from my perspective. Right. Is, is if the last couple are tough. And so one of the things actually, now that you say that, that like one of my favorite strength and conditioning coaches said to me was, they'll be tough, but you could do two more, yes. right? Like you could yeah. struggle through to do two more so that you're not actually at that critical failure point either. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, again, when we're focusing on this from a perspective of um, like the metabolic effects, if you're going to go to the gym and you're short on time, focus on your compound movements. So your squats, deads, bench, like the things where you're getting your most bang for your buck, um, using the most amount of muscles possible. So um, those, and also we're not doing this every, every single day. So as hybrid athletes, we're used to kind of training different systems and different ways all the time anyways, but you don't have to go into the gym lifting heavier day. We're talking like you're two to four times a week. Um, so, and then with that, the other interesting thing, so in Stacey Sims new book, they're also finding that along with lifting heavy, the other part of the puzzle is to do high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. And by that also, I mean, I mean, short bouts. So, and yeah. not every day, but again, you're two to three times a week. If you have a race on the weekend, then maybe it's just once in that week, but where you are bringing your heart rate up above your 85% max for short periods of time, your 10 to 40 seconds, all out efforts. Um, and it doesn't have to be for long and it doesn't have to be running. So it could be, you could be doing it on any of like your rower, your skier, your bike. Um, where you're pushing hard, you have a short recovery period, pushing hard, so you're getting your heart rate up. Um, and so what that actually does, and it could just, it could be for 10 to 20 minutes and you do that, you're two to three times a week. Um, so high, high intensity where you're getting into those, um, like your high 85% heart rate, what you're doing then is you're rushing. So the glucose from your blood is being rushed to the muscle tissue to replenish the glycogen. So now you're affecting the insulin systems, your insulin sensitivity, which again, we talked about is affected by uh, your lowering levels of estrogen. And then, um, so it's also, again, helping your mitochondrial density, which again, we talked about also lowers with estrogen. And when you were thinking about um, the weight that you're gaining, it helps you to burn fat and reduces the effects of that, um, the, the belly that you start to get during menopause. So it will actually reduce that because we're, we don't have to store that as much anymore. For sure. And I think, you know, sort of as a compromise, right, for the person that like really loves to go for the run, um, just tack on four to five really hard strides at the beginning and the end of your run, right? Like, yeah, you know, right? Like, it also has to be about what you love, right? I think one of the things, you know, that we, a lot of the research that I've, you know, started to focus on is people leave sport, play, activity, exercise, movement, whatever you want to call it, whatever you do, because it's no longer fun. And so if it's not fun, you're not going to show up the next day. And so we want people, clients, et cetera, to show up the next day. And so if for you, meeting up with your friends to go for a run is really important, preserve that, right? That's really important for your mental health, your physical health overall. But then just tack on these strides. Just do like four to five, 10 to 20 second strides at the beginning and the end. But like actually yeah. go hard. It also, just yeah. as an aside, will make your running even better because like you have to be efficient. Um, definitely do it on a hill. Like if you really want to work, if you really want to do like super cheat form work, just go run a hill, go run a hill really hard. You can't, you can't fake it because it, it feels off. Running a it hill slow still hurts. <laughs> like the fastest, yeah. the, like slow or fast, the sooner you get to the job, the less it hurts. Yeah. yeah. So, and this is, it's interesting too, because again, like I live in the world of gym and so people shoot these things at me all the time from social media and there's so much misinformation out there, but on social media and one of the big oh, things yeah. now is um, cortisol. So everything is about cortisol and everything is, we have to lower our cortisol levels. So the interest, and again, cortisol increases belly fat storage. And so it's interesting because what high intensity 
actually does is it counteracts the effects of overall cortisol levels. So because the misinformation, again, that I'm finding um, on TikTok and Instagram is that because high intensity interval training is intense, so your stress is elevated during the 10, 20 minutes that you're doing it, they people that don't really understand the science think therefore it's bad. But what it's actually doing overall throughout the rest of your day is lowering your total cortisol. Yeah, Mm -hmm. totally. And I actually, what I think is even more interesting is that scrolling through TikTok and the anxiety and the cortisol rush that you get from that, that's actually far, far worse than any other cortisol impacts. And the cortisol impacts from exercise are very different, right? That's a very specific stress that you're asking your body to do in a very natural way, right? Like it's totally natural for your heart rate to go up while you're doing something hard. It's totally natural to feel a little bit stressed when you're trying to do something that's physically challenging. And so bad cortisol is a toxic environment where you feel like you have to be on edge all the time and your heart rate is elevated because you feel like you have to be on the defense. That's bad cortisol, right? Like cortisol, right? Where you get the balance throughout the rest of your day. And if you work in a stressful environment, you really should go get that cortisol hit from exercise in the morning. So you can like level out wherever you're working. But like that cortisol, you know, that you get from exercise is it's expected from the body. In fact, the body craves it so that throughout the rest of the day, your cortisol can actually be at a level um, that allows you to function, to be productive, to be present with your kids, whatever it is that you're doing. Mm -hmm. There's so much misinformation about that. It makes me so mad. I don't go on TikTok and Instagram for those reasons. Oh, tell me. Well, my clients send it to me and I just (laughs) want to rip my hair out sometimes. The other interesting thing that I read in Stacey Sims' book was that um, the high intensity bouts again, because you're pushing your system to its max capacities yeah uh, that it actually so it increases the strength of your vascular system so by doing that then when you're in your day-to-day so when we talk about how during perimenopause we are less responsive to the changing in temperatures in the environment so we get hot flashes we get really cold so increasing the strength of the vascular system allows you to actually adapt to changing temperatures better so they find then high intensity interval training does actually reduce hot flashes and it reduces the amount um, that you feel cold in cold environments and you respond better to the changing environments. Mm -hmm. So interesting stuff. So yeah, but again, just one to three times a week for that short bouts, again, just strides after your runs intervals on your machines um and then lift heavy so and there and then you there's always of course there's room for your long runs and your long sessions yep. also um but just balancing it all out so um, i just say i love that training plan i want to do that that's kind of how we train isn't it <laughs> yeah, pretty much so lift heavy stuff and, and do sprints I'm, I'm down with that yeah yeah but like 200s are my like one fast 150s and all out 200s are like some of my favorite intervals. One of the things that I've always like find, found really interesting looking at marathon training was like speed session, 1Ks. I'm like, that's not speed. I'm like, <laughs> speed is like anywhere between like 50 and 200 meters going as fast as you can. And actually, if you want your marathon to be better, go and like one night a week, every two weeks, do intervals that are between 50 and 200 meters all out. No, you're not going to get the distance in, but you can either like manipulate volume or intensity. These are things that you all know, but that hit of intensity is so important for like the longer distance training as well. And then especially for females, right? Like throughout all these like hormone changes, like to the point of Dr. Stacey Sims's work, like all of that is super crucial. Also track workouts with your friends are so much fun. So (laughs) (laughs) yes, it is. Um, The last question then that we have, which I do find, again, this affects so many women, especially as they age, is sleep. So again, with our lowering estrogen and the hormones and rising cortisol at night quite often as well, a lot of women have a hard time staying asleep, falling asleep, or just constantly waking up. So do you find this and what do you know? Okay, so hi, I'm a sleep champion. Um, I have had a little bit of like affected sleep. I think generally speaking, most people have pretty poor sleep hygiene. I'm holding up my phone. 
right? Most people sleep with their phone beside their bed. Um, I think it's the worst thing that you can do for yourself. There are other alarm clocks that you can buy. There are other ways to take notes. Um, if you're worried about emergencies happening, you can put your phone on ring outside of the room, but not having it beside your bed is huge. Talk about a cortisol, right? Like thinking that it's there. A lot of people get up and they can't sleep. And what do they do? They scroll. And so all of a sudden your brain turns on and thinks that it's on. Um, sleep hygiene was always a really big thing in my house growing up. I was always a good sleeper, but um, I've always read before going to sleep, right? So, and I read fiction. I can't read nonfiction where then my brain goes like, oh, how do I implement this in my life? That's my morning routine. Um, but really setting up a sleep routine that works for you. So for some people that's having a hot shower, some people that's having a cool shower, some people that's having a hot bath, some people that's, um, you know, watching a TV show with their partner and then getting into bed. But it's this idea of like really disconnecting from your life and setting a routine and trying to stick with it. If you don't have a sleep routine, try and set one up, try and journal about it as to what works and what doesn't work. Um, I mean, I'm still training quite a bit. So like one of my challenges as a marathon runner is I wake up so hungry in the middle of the night, like <laughs> 2 a.m. I'm like, hmm. So I, I take a protein supplement at night now um, that I found really helpful. It's also got magnesium, bisglycinate in it, GABA, one other thing that I can't remember off the top of my head, but like like um, supplements that are known to help um, with sleep. Uh, again, I drink something. So I drink, you know, I go to bed hydrated. I go to bed with a snack, all good things for me. Um, but it's really like setting that routine. If you have disrupted sleep and it usually comes in two formats. You wake up with a racing mind, try and put a notebook beside your bed and put those thoughts down and see if you can get yourself back to sleep. Um, Dr. Amy Bender has done some really cool work with sleep and athletes. And so if you're really not falling asleep again, after sort of 20 minutes, you got to get up, go to a different place, ideally read a book, don't get on your phone and try and get back to sleep. If you're having trouble going to sleep, it's probably most likely actually like sleep hygiene but it may actually be like a time to talk to your doctor about like the hormones that you like hormone replacement therapy. Um, but I think first and foremost, it's like really trying a sleep routine, like two to three nights is not trying something. Charles Duhigg's um, habit book, like you have to try something solidly for three weeks for it to develop as a habit. You really have to like try something for three weeks before you can see if there's actually an effect. I don't know that I actually answered your question. That was quite a broad answer, but I hope that helps people. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And um, yeah, again, like you're establishing a calming routine before bed. And even um, like, even if you have to move your dinner time earlier, so you're not digesting, like just so your whole system is in a rest and, and outside of the digest phase. Um, so it's not focusing on that. It's you're just on rest. And I think the screen is probably a big thing too. But again, get your hormones checked because progesterone can have an effect that will help you sleep also. So if that one is plummeting, then it could be that also. So there's so many factors um, around the sleep. And then there are supplements that help, like you said, um, that you can also try. So and different types of um like calming supplements. I have to take, I take magnesium before bed and uh, it helps again with calming and the relaxation phase of muscle. Um, so just, you have to find what works for you too. So yes, I appreciate that. We, we did talk an awful lot about an awful lot. I think we got all of the questions um, answered. I do got one. Oh, no, more. Dave's got questions. I got, one more. Oh, yes. no, I got one more. I got one more. This isn't mine. This isn't mine. So, um, and this is coming from an elite athlete perspective. And you may have touched on a bit of it, so just, but I think maybe we talked about from a not so much an elite athlete perspective. Um, but what are the major impacts on your training output? And is there anything you can do as an athlete to support that performance? For sure. So um, I think the biggest change for me has been the intensity of certain workouts. So I used to like, like clockwork, do workouts Monday, Thursday, Saturday. Monday and Thursday were pretty intense. Saturday was a lot less intense comparatively, but more intense compared to like easy days. And I now sort of primarily focus with two really big intense days. And then there's sort of like 
a medium day before the intense day. Um, and then in a sense, as much rest as I need. Um, and so some of those intense days become really long. I'm a marathon, right? So just let me preface that around like the specifics of what I'm sharing. So I think it's, it's managing the intensity. If you looked at the metrics from those two days, the metrics of the intensity equal what was on those three days. And so in a sense, there's no people are like, well, then you're losing it on training. It's like, no, I'm just making things even harder on those two days so that I get the same bouts of intensity, but that I get enough recovery in between those things. So I can really go hard again on those intense days. I think the other thing is, um, is it's like self-compassion and self-kindness so that um, like, particularly when I had like achy knees and no muscle firing, right. Giving myself the grace to take the extra rest day so that I could really go hard. And I made the mistake a couple times of trying to go hard when I wasn't quite as recovered as I thought I was. And you actually then sacrifice that workout as opposed to getting that massive intensity hit by waiting another day. You don't get to pick when race day is. That's the hardest part. And there's certain things that like everybody has bad race days, right? Those things happen. And I think um, there's just a few more variables that females have to navigate with a menstrual cycle you know, across the lifespan compared to males. And it's, and it's, and it can be really challenging mentally. I think if you know that your hormones affect your mental health a lot, that you've got to set up strategies so that you can go into your race as confident. I think I'm going to, again, use Camille Heron. Camille Heron had her period during further, right? The six day marathon. People say when you have your period, you can't go as hard. I think she just proved wrong. I've had Twelve world records had later. I think she did. Okay. 13, just so 13. we're clear, 13 world records. Yeah. <laughs> I think she did. Okay. And I think that's a good point to bring up, you know, like it's, it is possible. It's a little bit different, but I think we've also, um, sort of framed that when you have your period, you can't do certain things. And I think that's wrong. I think M Pallant, I believe is her last name. She's a triathlete. She had her period last year during a 70.3 she like smashingly won and why i bring that up is um she posted it on instagram like the her win winning photo and she had a blood spot and some guy was like well couldn't you have photoshopped that out and she's like no because you know what this is my life and i i live this every day and if it makes you uncomfortable that's you that's not me right this is what 50 percent of the population deals with and i'm racing for like four and a half hours like I'm not stopping to change my tampon because day <laughs> one is heavy. I'm in the middle of a race and my goal is to win. I don't care about the other stuff, right? And and removing the stigma from that. And But also to say that you can do hard things when you have your period, right? I think Whoop and Aura and some of those activity trackers have done a disservice to women to say, you have your period, take it easy. And sometimes, like, listen, I've had cramps where I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't go to the workout right now. I got to start this out before I can actually, like, go smash this. But for the most part, you can show up. I think um, the Lancet last week did a, a disservice to women by saying that hormones do not affect mood and that most women do not have anxiety because of their hormone fluctuations. We may not have clinical anxiety and clinical depression, we absolutely know that there is a link between hormones and mental health and mental performance. And so you need to figure out like, what are your strengths as an athlete and what are your weaknesses? And if your hormones affect your mental health, not clinically, but enough that on race day, you don't show up feeling confident. You've got to figure out strategies so that you can trust yourself to show up and be the best version of yourself on that day, period or not, perimenopause symptoms or not. So that like you can go and smash it the way you've been doing it in practice on race day and like going to the limit. Sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it isn't. But going in with the mindset that that's just kind of like the luck of the draw with racing as opposed to that's the luck of the draw of my hormones and this reframing and reshifting of how we think about things. Does that answer your question, Dave? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's all. And I, I would that's say excellent. that's excellent. You know, like as as a you know i really appreciate you dave sitting here and i know you maybe didn't get to ask as many questions as you want and this is like very new territory and a lot of people are starting to talk about it and i thank you for doing that and it's about supporting us i think for a long time part of the reason we didn't talk about perimenopause was 
a lot of people said like, that's not a thing. And I think a lot of men said that that was not a thing. I think one of the things I'd love to see kids in particular learn is how to come to a coach with an injury without complaining. Hey, my Achilles is hurting. I don't think I should put spikes on today. I'd like to do this instead. And I think, you know, how we come to it, like, I think as a partner, like when Raul's not here, but like, I know I can be super whiny and be like, oh, this is so hard. And as a partner, it's really hard for you as well, because it's almost like we need an outlet to share the things that we're going through, but it sounds like complaining. And in a way we need a space to a safe space to complain about the challenges that we're going through, because we look at guys beside us and we're like, it's just, it's just so easy. And I, and I, and there's this like jealousy and so thank you for letting us kind of voice our, our opinions this way. But I, I think it's also really important that we as women, when we start to talk about things, that we do it in a way that, how do I say this? Not that it's professional, but it's going to make people feel uncomfortable. But I want it to make people feel uncomfortable in a way that they want to lean in and help me as opposed to lean away and be afraid. And so, hey, I'm just struggling today. Like, I'm you know, it's really hard to do this lift. I've got really bad cramps. Could we think about, you know, eccentrically loading my, my quads in a different way. Right. And all of a sudden, if I said it to you like that, it's like, yeah, absolutely happy to help you as opposed to like, I just can't do this. It just, it almost shuts down the conversation. And so I'm not victim blaming or victim shaming. I'm just asking women to advocate for themselves so that, you know, men want to lean in. And I'm asking guys to ask those questions like, Hey, how are you doing? Like, do you need to like shift your workout a bit? Like hilariously, like my boobs used to get really sore during perimenopause. So I couldn't bench press, right? Like if it would cut, I was like, ah, no. Right. But I could bench press with like separate, like with dumbbells, two dumbbells as opposed to, right. And so it was like, dumbbells are better anyway. I know. Any, but I, <laughs> there's just something so satisfying about like plates <laughs> on either side. I'm like, it anyways. looks cool. It looks cool. It looks, I'm also lifting alone in my friend's gym. Like nobody's <laughs> seeing it. <laughs> but, you know, it's this idea of like men leaning in and women advocating for themselves in a way that like we can meet in the middle and work together and find common ground as opposed to feeling like we're on polar, we're polarized to each other. Awesome. I'm good. Thanks. I know I went too long. <laughs> no, I think uh, that was fantastic, actually. It's probably a good way to end things off. So, um thanks so much Sasha for coming on um it was definitely a topic I was looking forward to discussing um and because the reality is is all women are going to go through this whether we like it or not and the more we can talk about it and learn (laughs) from each other the less people will suffer through it and like you said just be able to have more open conversation and um you know thrive through it still so thank you so much for sharing um with our listeners everything that you've gone through and um all your knowledge around it as well so We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate you guys. All right. Take care.